Hi, I'm reading from Will the Real Christians Please Stand Up by Maurice Barrett. Well, um, we've arrived at part two, The Cost. I'm going to start by reading a poem by the author. No more. It is enough, I cry. I cannot bear the awful shame. My eyes no longer look aright. They turn inside. I see myself. Blackness. Sin. My body can no longer stand. Knees bend beneath the load. Body lays upon the ground. Lifeless. Still. But what is this upon my brow? I feel a drop of liquid fall and with great effort turn my head and gaze upon this wondrous sight of bleeding hands and wounded feet and from his side a river flows which covers me and more besides my heart and soul are sanctified no more the fear of guilt and shame my heart is light my spirit free yet still a slave to serve him more chapter four the principles there is a great cost to be paid when a person becomes a disciple and we need to consider this cost before we can make a decision that will influence our whole lifestyle. I want to look more closely at this cost for Jesus laid out the conditions very plainly indeed. Strange instructions. In Matthew 16 verse 16 we read that Peter had a revelation that Jesus was the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus says that Peter did not come to this conclusion by himself, but that it was a divine revelation. Now that Peter and the other disciples knew this, it would be reasonable to expect that Jesus would commission them to spread this good news, that the Messiah they had waited for had now arrived. They could now with authority and confidence proclaim this revelation to the world. But in verse 20, Jesus says something quite to the contrary. Then Jesus charged his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Why would Jesus give this strange commandment to his disciples? Why would he want this fact hidden? The secret is in verse 21. From that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. A change of ministry. If you read the rest of Matthew's Gospel from this point, you will find that the ministry of Jesus changes. Apart from one incident where Jesus heals a boy with whom the disciples had difficulties, there are no more healings recorded. Jesus now begins to prepare himself and his disciples to fulfil his purpose on earth, which was to suffer, die an atoning death and be raised from the dead. This was a real reason Jesus came to earth. The miracles and healings were to only show the character of his father, love, compassion, mercy and grace. The miracles were not demonstrations of Jesus' power, nor proof that he was a Christ. If they had been demonstrative proofs, then Jesus failed because the people did not believe him. He was crucified as a blasphemer. Peter could not understand this change of direction in Jesus' ministry. Like so many Christians today, he was looking for the outward kingdom to be immediately manifested on earth. Jesus therefore had to rebuke Peter in the strongest language possible. He used exactly the same words to Peter that he had used to speak to the devil after the temptations in the wilderness. Get thee behind me, Satan. Why such strong language? It was because Jesus was being offered the kingdoms of this world immediately and without the cross. This is the modern kingdom now doctrine that offers the kingdom without the cross. Peter did not want Jesus to go to the cross because he wanted the kingdom immediately and without any suffering or hardship. I believe the saying, no cross, no crown, is a true one and is always applicable. Three simple steps. Jesus, having now firmly established the way he must go, makes it very clear that this is also the way his disciples must go. Verse 24 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Three simple instructions. And yet these are some of the most difficult words that Jesus ever uttered. 
and we must examine them in detail, for these three steps are the secrets that contain the essence of the entire Christian life. On first examination, it would seem that Jesus has put these three instructions in the wrong order. Surely, following should be the first step. And then when we are further along the way, perhaps we could consider whether we should deny ourselves a little. The cross sounds so frightening that to most Christians, it is far safer to put it last on the list and hope that it never comes. We know that Jesus was a master teacher. So what was his purpose for presenting the lifestyle of a disciple in this order? He can only have meant that unless we have denied self and taken up our cross, then we are not truly following Jesus. Perhaps we are following our church or our denomination, our doctrines, our favourite evangelists or our conscience. But we deceive ourselves if we think that we are following Jesus. Following is only a natural consequence of fulfilling the first two conditions. I believe that these three statements of Jesus deal with three things we know very well in our lives. The three things which hinder us most in our Christian walk, the world, the flesh and the devil. I believe that denying yourself is the way to deal with the world Taking up the cross is the way to deal with the flesh, our old Adamic nature. And following Jesus, the natural consequence, is the way to deal with the devil. Once we have dealt with the world and the flesh, we will naturally have power over the devil. But only then. Destroying the work of the devil. In 1 John 3 verse 8, we are told that Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. What is the work of the devil? The opposite of the work of God. What is God's work? It is to make men holy. The devil's work is the opposite, to cause men to rebel against God and become, like himself, unholy. To destroy the work of the devil, then, is simply to undo or reverse this process and bring men back into fellowship and obedience to God so that their characters become like God's. This is the whole purpose of the church, to make men holy. If we have not left this world, if our old nature has not been dealt with, that is crucified, how can we possibly become holy? Destroying the devil's work is the third and final stage. For this we need the character of Christ, not just his power. For the devil is not afraid of power unless it is accompanied by holiness. He can substitute all the power and all the gifts, but he can never be holy or show the character of Christ. Let us now look closely at each of these three conditions which Jesus presents to us. 